Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to RBCM at Outside. My name is Liz Crocker, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. And um, today we are live outside at Beacon Hill Park, which is in Victoria, British Columbia, just down the road from the Royal BC Museum. Um, and the Beacon Hill Park is in the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the also known as the Songhees and, and uh, Esquimalt First Nations. So we're very grateful to be here today on this beautiful day in this beautiful park. And uh, the program today is called Living Fossils and it's with Dr. Kenmar and Dr. Victoria Arbor and we're gonna get to them in a minute. Um, but before we do, I just wanna let you know that these programs are recorded. And uh, so you can go to the museum website and you can see all the past programs and we'll record this one as well. And um, we usually do them uh, every second Wednesday at 2 p.m. However, I'm going away for a little vacation. So the next one isn't until August 19th, another Wednesday afternoon. And that one is going to be a special one where we're going to virtually go to um, Saturna Island, which is part of Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. And we're going to have a virtual walk with a uh, park interpreter, Athena uh, George, and she's going to talk to us about orcas. So we were gonna go there in person this summer as one of uh, our field tripper programs, but of course, because of the pandemic that was canceled, we couldn't, couldn't do it in person. So we're gonna do it virtually. Um, so hope you'll join us for that. And all the information for that's already up on the website. If you wanna um, register in advance for free, that'd be great. Um, so, um, so, so usually when uh, we're not in a pandemic, uh, I'm working on uh, programs that are like online learning programs like this and do uh, digital field trips with schools and senior centers and community groups. And but I also do a field tripper program where we're outside in parks and local spaces and having conversations about natural history and human history. So this RBCM outside is a little bit of a mix of, of both of those programs. So, um, and, it's, and we're live, and it's, so if it's a little choppy, we, we do have a pretty good internet connection, but sometimes um, there's a little, little uh, gets kind of um, choppy because of the connection. So, but hopefully, fingers crossed, the technology will be on our side today. Um, okay, and also, um, we are in webinar format, if you've never done this before. So we can't see or hear you, you can see and hear us, but we can interact with you through the chat window. And my colleagues, Chris and Wes, are watching the chat in Facebook, Facebook Live, and also the Zoom room. So any comments or questions can go there, and hopefully they'll get to us. They will get to us, I'm sure. So I'm going to flip my camera. They'll get to Ken? you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Chris. They'll get to me. Ken, get back in your position. Here we go. It's <laughs> Dr. Ken Mar over there. <laughs> he was picking up garbage. Um, I'm going to introduce Ken in a second. But Ken is here in the park with me. So we are uh, social distancing. And uh, Victoria, Dr. Victoria Arbor is with us in the Zoom room. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna make her visible here. So Hello. hey, it's Victoria. So <laughs> Victoria is curator of paleontology at the museum and Dr. Ken Mar is curator of botany at the museum. And so I am just really looking forward to wandering through this, this uh, park a heavily managed urban park but lots of nature around us and to see what their two brains put together um, because we um, often will walk by these plants in places like this and and have no idea that some of these plants have been around for a very long time even uh, some of them at the time of dinosaurs and so I just love that idea that it's like reminding us of our uh, of the antiquity that's that's surrounding us everywhere so before we get to that, uh, we have prepared a little quiz for you to get your brains warmed up uh, for the program. Ken and, and Victoria prepared the questions. So Chris is going to lead us through five short questions. Facebook, um, sorry, you can't participate. You can, you, can, you can kind of participate. You just can't write your answers in the window. And the Zoom folks, please participate. The are anonymous responses, so we won't know who sent them in. And uh, yeah, we'll go through the, the questions after. So go ahead, Chris, with the quiz. Okay, so the first question is, which group of plants evolved first? Ferns or flowers? That's question number one. And if you're in the Zoom room, I, I launched the poll so you can, you can vote now. Question number two, according to the fossil record, flowers with many separated, flowers with many separated petals uh, appear earlier than flowers with few joined petals. Think of petunia flowers. True or false? 
Question number three, the trunks of hardwoods, trees with flowers, and softwoods, trees with cones, have the same type of cells to move water. True or false? Question number four, did plant-eating dinosaurs ever eat wood? True or false, or yes or no? And then what is, the question number five is, what is fossilized tree sap, sap called? Is it called oil, is it called amber, or is it called coal? So those are the five questions. And the first question, so we'll go to the first question again. Which group of plants evolved first, ferns or flowers? So this is a question for, for Ken, maybe. I think I'll turn that one over to, to Victoria. Oh yeah, Victoria. Sure. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I think is important to remember is that not all the plants we see around us stay evolved at the same time. So just like plants or just like animals have changed through time, so have plants. And some groups of plants appear earlier in the fossil record than others. And in this case, Ferns are some of the earliest plants that would have colonized land. So ferns go way back in the fossil record, like hundreds of millions of years, and flowers are a relatively new invention. So we can trace the, the earliest flowers um, back about 200-ish million years, uh, but flowers only really start to become common about 100 million years ago. And that was the answer of everyone in the Zoom room, so well done, nice. Zoom room. Uh, question number two, according to the fossil record, flowers with many separated petals appear earlier than flowers with few joined petals. Think of petunia flowers. Is that true or is that false? Here we have a little disagreement. So most people said true, some people said false. Victoria. Yeah, so Chris, oh. uh, I'll take this one. So okay. that, that the correct answer is true and we will look at some examples of that a little bit later in the walk. Great. Question number three, the trunks of hardwoods, trees with flowers, and softwoods, trees with cones, have the same type of cells to move water. True or false? And again, most people thought true. Good. This is an education opportunity. So the correct answer is false. Oh. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when we look at the magnolia. But in, in general, uh, going from the earlier uh, conifers and other gymnosperms, um, when angiosperms evolved, there was, at the same time, and of course, gradual process, there was a change in the internal at anatomy of stems. And uh, gymnosperms uh, have just one cell type that functions both to support the stem and to transport water. Angiosperms, the flowering plants, have specialized cells for conducting water and specialized cells for support. Great. Question number four, we've had, it's a, a toss up because uh, it's e almost equally divided with the answer. So the question is, did plant eating dinosaurs ever eat wood? Half say yes, half say no. Victoria, what do you say? All right, so this is one of these kind of weird things that dinosaurs did sometimes. We actually have evidence that some plant eating dinosaurs, the duck billed dinosaurs, did sometimes eat wood on purpose. So not just like the occasional twig, but actually eating like rotting logs. And we're not 100% sure why they did that, but it's a pretty interesting, weird thing that they did. Mm. Nice. And the last question, and everyone got this, uh, what is fossilized tree sap called? And everyone said amber, which is the right answer. That is the right answer, yep. So that it's a beautiful gemstone. Sometimes it has little insects inside it. Um, but I also wanted to point out that coal is another type of fossilized plants. It's basically like compressed plant remains that uh, formed in swamps. So it is another type of plant fossil, um, but the tree sap is what we call amber. Great. Chris, can you hear me? This is Liz. Yeah. Can you spotlight my video for me now? <laughs> yep, your spotlight. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to turn back to Ken. Okay, and actually, I will just now turn over the walk to Ken and Victoria and only jump in I have, if I have to. Here we go. Perfect. Victoria, I think, I think you want to start right here. Yeah, I think that's great. So uh, this walk is 
a little bit of a walk back in time um, and a chance for us to kind of imagine what the world might have looked like um, in the past, maybe when the dinosaurs were around, maybe a little bit after the dinosaurs were around. Um, so I used to live in this neighborhood near Beacon Hill Park, and so I had a lot of fun like wandering around and, and noticing that there were some really interesting trees that are not super common in our forests today, but that might have been more common in the past. And of course, one of the most like interesting trees in the whole park, in my opinion, are the giant redwoods. So this is a, a tree, its scientific name is called Sequoia dendron. Today, Sequoia dendron is mostly found in California. So this is a tree that's been planted here on purpose by people because it's so interesting. Um, and Sequoia dendron is just this colossal tree. These are some of the, not necessarily the tallest trees, but some of the most massive trees that have ever lived. Um, and so you can just get a sense of how, how big that tree is relative to Ken, who's a pretty tall guy, I will say. He's not a short person. Um, so Sequoia dendron is this interesting tree. It belongs to a group of trees called the redwood trees. So it's the giant redwood and there's a couple other species, one of which we will meet later on in the walk. Um, and during the time of the dinosaurs, a lot of the forests were actually composed of redwood trees. Um, so these are conifers, so they're related to things like spruce and pine and fir trees, but they're off on their sort of own little branch of the plant family tree. Um, and they are, yeah, some of them were super huge. Um, so Sequoia dendron didn't, itself didn't necessarily live at the time of the dinosaurs, but some of its really close relatives did. Um, and it's just like a super interesting tree, these huge trees. And you can really sort of like picture like some of these long necked sauropods maybe reaching high to get at some of the, the leaves and branches um, in these extremely tall trees. Um, I also really like this tree because Beacon Hill Park is home to a flock of peacocks and sometimes they like to hang out in this tree, which is pretty fun, but I don't see any of them there today. Another cool thing at the base of this tree that you might notice is that around the tree, we don't have grass. We've got grass all through lots of the park, but then at the base of this tree, we don't really have grass. We've got kind of like the needles and mulch around the tree and then lots of ferns. And so one thing that I think a lot of people don't know is that during the age of dinosaurs, grass had not evolved yet. Grass is actually pretty new. Um, grass is a type of flowering plant and flowering plants only really started to evolve about a hundred million years ago and diversify. Um, and so if you were walking around like a dinosaur forest, say like 75 million years ago, you wouldn't see any grass necessarily, but you would see lots and lots of ferns. So your meadows and groves would be full of ferns, kind of like these ones. Um, and that's actually what a lot of dinosaurs would eat. So my favorite group of dinosaurs, the, uh, the ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs, probably mostly ate ferns. So ferns are very good dinosaur food. Um, so I think they're pretty cool. So when you sort of stand and look at this big giant redwood tree with the ferns below it, it's actually a pretty good um, visual for what an ancient Cretaceous forest might have looked like. So it's a pretty cool spot. Ken, do you have any cool facts about like redwood trees? Oh yeah, and they've got these really cool cones that are very distinctive. No, I, I don't have anything to add, Victoria. Um, one okay. quick note, we, we talked about this with the uh, field trippers in the native plant garden. This is uh, ferns reproduced by spores and uh, seeds evolved quite a bit later in uh, plant evolution. Yeah, so that's one of the sort of neat differences between these two plants we're looking at. So we won't see seeds or cones from the ferns, but we will see them from our big redwood trees. So right behind this redwood tree is a super interesting tree. This is one of my favorite trees in the whole park. There's a couple of them throughout Beacon Hill Park, but this is a really nice one. This is a really neat conifer, one of these like seed, uh, seed trees. Um, and it is called Araucaria or the monkey puzzle tree. Um, that's kind of the common name for it. And it is just a super bizarre tree. So it's got, it's got this very spiky appearance. Once you know what they look like, you can't really miss them if you have any growing in your neighborhood. So monkey puzzle trees are, again, another branch of these conifer, uh, the conifer family. And they are another one of the trees that would have made uh, the forests of dinosaur era times, and especially the forests in the Southern Hemisphere. So today, monkey puzzle trees and its close relatives are found mostly in Chile and other parts of South America. They're really important to, to uh, some of the ecosystems in Chile. But if we go look at the fossil record, we actually see super close relatives of Araucaria, um, 
all the way back into like the Jurassic period. So the time when sauropod dinosaurs were really common. And yeah, it's just a super interesting tree. These trees make some of the biggest cones like ever, basically. So they're just like these giant cones, like sort of the, you, you need like two hands almost to hold them. And I think we can see a few up high. Um, they're those kind of weird, like little circular blebs um, up towards the top of the tree. So if you have monkey puzzle trees nearby you, it's a good idea not to stand under them when all of those cones are like ready to drop. Um, Cause yeah. I think they would probably hurt a little bit to have on your head. <laughs> so I'll just and then um, jump get a close up look at these. So oh, sorry, he, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, a uh, common house plant, Norfolk Island pine, also belongs to this group of plants. And uh, just to illustrate how much remains to be known about the world, in 1995 in Australia, another relative of this group called the Wallomia pine, W O L L O M I A, uh, was discovered. And all of these look distinctly different from each other, but they all belong to the same lineage. And I just really like the needles on these trees because they're just, they're really spiky, really tough. I know some researchers have speculated that they might have this very prickly appearance to prevent animals from eating them. So maybe to discourage dinosaurs from eating all of their leaves. Um, I don't know if we know that for sure, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and yeah, they're just like super interesting charismatic trees and, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll be able to spot them. But yeah, so if you went to the Southern hemisphere, like a hundred million years ago, these would be some of the dominant forest trees. And for people that are wondering why they're called monkey puzzle tree, I asked Dr. Google this morning and one speculation is monkeys looking at this tree would be very puzzled as to how to climb it. <laughs> <laughs> So are we going to proceed now, Victoria, or was there more to Yeah, I think, I think now is a good time to go for a walk. And um, while you guys are walking, if you want to put the screen on me, I can show off a couple of fossils in the fossil collection. All right, perfect. Um, so in our fossil collection at the museum, I'm actually sitting in one of the paleontology <laughs> collection rooms, and we have about 50 cabinets of fossils that are about 53 million years old from a site called the Maccabee Fossil Beds. And this site is uh, a little bit after the end of the age of dinosaurs, but it's super rich in fossil plants. And so we have this huge collection of like 15 to 20,000 fossils from this site, most of which are plant fossils. And it's a pretty cool site because there's a lot of really familiar plants that we would expect to see today. Lots of flowering plants. We can see lots of like interesting leaf fossils. Here's an example of a beautiful leaf fossil from this particular site. Um, there's things like pine trees. So we've got lots of examples of pine needles. Let's see if I can get this a little closer here. Um, so lots of things that are really familiar, um, but a weird mix of plants. So it's a kind of like a temperate forest, like what we would have around here now, but also mixed with some very tropical tree plants, which is pretty cool. Um, so we also have some things like ginkgo leaves. Whoops, I always get the wrong way on Zoom because it's like reversed from what I'm looking at. Um, so we have some beautiful ginkgo tree fossils. If, if, this is a tree that's often planted in city streets. Um, Sometimes it's called the maidenhair tree and the gymnosperm. So it's not a flowering plant, but it's not quite a conifer either. Um, and, and ginkgo is really neat because it, the fossils of it look almost exactly the same as the species that are alive today. So this is an example of something some people like to call a living fossil or just a, an organism that hasn't really changed much in appearance. It's still been evolving, but its appearance has stayed really similar. So we have examples of ginkgo that look a lot like the ginkgo we have today. But we also have what I like to call the weird ginkgo. So there's also examples of ginkgo trees that look pretty different, where their leaves are kind of split, um, and they have a very different appearance. Uh, and that tells us about all this diversity that used to exist in British Columbia um, of ginkgos that are now only represented by one living species. So how are you guys doing on your walk over to the next tree of interest? So we are almost there, Victoria. We almost thought we there. would stop. Yeah, we thought we would stop here and look at these lily flowers, uh, pond lily flowers. Um, because they are also in the fossil record appear relatively early. 
early angiosperm flowering plants and you can see the mini petals um, you may not be able to see that they're separate but it's another example of the early flower form and now we're going to uh, walk on over to the magnolia and um, uh, fortunately the uh, magnolia is in, in, in full bloom at least there's a flower we can reach and um, yeah quite a spectacular plant Perfect. And the, the crows are having a good time out here today as well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, here we go, Liz. Um, Perfect. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm holding up a weed, bindweed, um, which illustrates the principle of diffused petals. Um, and uh, the, the derivation of that flower is from five petals. Uh, you could make out the five different parts from there and just contrast that with this huge flower with many separate petals. So this has been one of the trends in, in plant evolution is the reduction in the number of floral parts and the fusion of the floral parts. Um, slide, Chris. So the other thing that kind of we alluded to in the quiz was the structure of the stem. So uh, the gymnosperms, the earlier plants, uh, only have one cell type that function both to support the stem as well as to conduct water. So there's little, these, these cells are called tracheids and there's little holes in the cell walls that connect one plant, one cell to another. And uh, water moves up through the tree in a process that probably we won't go into right now. Um, but actually, we'll go into it real quick. So uh, because water is a polar molecule, in other words, it has a positive end and a negative end, or a plus and a minus end, uh, it can form a chain of molecules all the way from the soil into the roots, up through the stem, and out through the leaves. And every time a water molecule evaporates from the leaf surface, that pulls the next water molecule up through that continuous chain. And uh, that's the best explanation people have been able to come up with, with how water is transported from the soil up through those really tall trees that we just looked at at the beginning, the sequoia dendron. If water wasn't a polar molecule, that would be totally impossible. So plants have a bit of a um, trade-off they have to make because they need to release, need to open those uh, openings in the leaves called stomata in order to allow the water to leave, but if it, and to let carbon dioxide in for photosynthesis. But obviously if too much water is leaving the leaves and the plant experiences moisture stress. So, um, so as you can see on the left side of that image, there is the gymnosperm wood. And on the right side is the angiosperm root wood. And you can see how different they look. Those big wide cells of the angiosperm wood are the water conducting cells and the narrower smaller cells are these uh, cells that function for support, and those are called fibers. So fiber is an actual, an, an anatomical plant cell type. Um, and occasionally I look at charcoal from archeological sites and I can tell right away, um, even if I can't get a good cross section, I can tell right away if it's an angiosperm or a gymnosperm just by the pattern of the, uh, the, the, the holes and et cetera on the walls of the large vessel elements, the large cells that conduct water. So um, yeah, Victoria, I think you you probably want to say something more. Here. Yeah, so so I think magnolia trees are really cool because these are some of the earliest examples of flowers that we find in the fossil record. Flowers probably evolved a little bit before magnolias show up, but magnolia uh, relatives are really some of the first times that we get really good examples of fossil flowers. Um, and so some of the oldest magnolias go back to about 100 million years ago. That's in the mid-Cretaceous. Um, so the Cretaceous is the last chunk of time in the age of dinosaurs. And so what's kind of 
thing cool is that a lot of the magnolias back then, the flowers would look really similar, but most of them were probably a lot smaller. So they didn't necessarily make big trees. Um, a lot of them would have been sort of like low lying shrubs or maybe small trees. And they would have been sort of scattered in around these forests that are still mostly made of conifers like redwoods. Um, but I think it's pretty cool to think about, um, you know, going into this like dinosaur forest and maybe seeing seeing a dinosaur kind of having a snooze underneath these beautiful flowers and in the magnolia trees. Um, magnolias are neat because they sort of signal the beginning of a big change in like terrestrial environments at that point. So when flowers evolve, a lot of things change. It's really cool. About 100 million years ago, we start to get flowers. Um, a lot of the dinosaurs change, the sort of groups of dinosaurs that are really common and large. Um, and if we can zoom over to me for just a second, if we can focus on my screen, I just want to show something really neat um, that we have in the collection here. So I have a cast. This is a cast of a, a duck-billed dinosaur jaw, not a real one. I wouldn't handle it quite so um, uh, uncarefully if I was uh, handling an original fossil. But duck-billed dinosaurs evolve around the same time as some of the first flowering plants start to diversify and become more abundant. And we also see these really interesting changes in dinosaur teeth at that time. So instead of having just sort of simple pig-like teeth, um, both duck-billed dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs like Triceratops started to evolve these crazy things called dental batteries. So these are all teeth stacked on top of each other and they make this really cool grinding surface. So this is the tongue side of the jaw and they have this grinding surface a little bit like mammal molars, but they did it in their own very dinosaur-y way. So is that because of the origin of flowers? Um, why did they need to evolve these really like grinding um, teeth in order to process food relative to like when it was mostly just conifers and cycads around? So yeah, like the evolution of plants and dinosaurs is really closely linked. Another thing that we start to see is we actually start to see a lot more interactions of insects in the fossil record. So I'm using a Maccabee example, but you can start to see examples of insects feeding on leaves. This is a really cool example. So these little holes are like the evidence of a, some sort of little insect having a nibble on a leaf. Um, and that's partly because a lot of angiosperms are able to shed their leaves and replace them. Um, and so it's not really a big deal if an insect eats them. Um, so this is also when we start to see a lot more interaction between insects and plants in a way that's very familiar to us today. Um, we also see the rise of pollinating insects, things like bees uh, and pollinating beetles. And yeah, it's just like a really big change. The, the arrival of flowers is a really big deal in, in the evolution of life. Um, and magnolias are some of the oldest and earliest ones. So I think they're really special for that reason, in addition to being really pretty and smelling really nice. So speaking of that, we have a question from Jody. Uh, yeah. She asks, or they ask, do, you, do we know what might have been one of the earliest flowers earlier than magnolia? Um, there are some, so one problem is it's really hard to tell fossils in the fossil re or fossil flowers in the fossil record because flowers are super delicate um, and sometimes they can look a little bit like leaves so they just don't preserve very well. Um, so I'm trying to remember exactly what some of the older flowers are. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist so I don't know quite as much about all fossil plants. Um, but I do know that there's a few examples in the fossil record that are much older uh, but Paleontologists like to argue about them because they're super hard to identify. They're not always preserved well. Um, so that's a great question. You might have to go and do a little bit of Googling and searching yourself for that question. Jody, if you Google the name Jeff Sarella, S-A-A-R-E-L-A, -A -E you will get uh, one paper about that. Oh, cool. Ken, Ken yeah. can you spell that again? Last S name, S-A-A. R-E-L-A. He's at the Canadian Muse Museum of Nature. Okay, great, thanks. Cool. That's great. All right, so that's kind of what I have to say about magnolia trees. Oh, I see you guys have already made it over to my favorite trees in the park. Um, so this is a tree that I think is really cool. Um, this is, uh, I love all of them, but I think these are some of my favorite ones. This is another redwood tree. This is the dawn redwood, so different from the giant redwood. This is a tree called Meta Sequoia. 
Uh, and they are just one of my favorite trees because they are super common fossils to find in a lot of like the dinosaur sites I go to. And uh, dawn redwoods, they don't get quite as big as giant redwoods, but they do some really interesting things. They basically haven't really changed in appearance in like a hundred million years, which is so crazy. So they appear in the fossil record and you can find leaves that look just like the ones you will see on dawn redwoods today that look almost identical. Do you think we could get a close look at some of their leaves? Yeah, so they have these beautiful kind of like fluffy feathery leaves. So these are still conifers, but they have kind of soft needles. And what's really cool, and I'll show a picture in a moment, uh, I've got some examples here, is they look, you can find examples of in the fossil record 50 million years ago, 75 million years ago, 100 million years ago of leaves that look just like that. Um, and I think that is really cool. Metasequoia is a really interesting tree because we actually knew about it first from fossils. So fossil metasequoia was described before we found any living examples because metasequoia was almost in the wild. It was found uh, in just like one or two very small groves uh, in China um, back in the 1940s. And now it's cultivated in lots of different places and it does really well in places like British Columbia. That's partly because it used to be found all over the Northern Hemisphere um, for most of its evolutionary history. So it disappearing from those ranges is actually kind of a new phenomenon. It's been found as far up as the high Canadian Arctic, uh, which tells us that it always wasn't always covered in ice and it was often a lot warmer and there were like metasequoia forests up there. Metasequoia has this really interesting sort of red bark. It's full of tannin like you find in tea. Um, and what else is cool about metasequoia? Oh, metasequoia um, sheds its needles each year. So kind of like a flowering tree, like a deciduous tree, um, it actually drops its needles each year. And there's some idea that it actually evolved that ability because it had moved up into these very high latitude Arctic regions for part of its evolution. And so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to keep your leaves and needles when it's dark for several months a year. So it evolved this really interesting ability to drop its needles. So in the fall, um, these metasequoias drop all their needles and they make these beautiful sort of orange mats on the ground underneath them. And it's actually quite pretty when they do that as well. And then in the spring, they don't grow flowers because they're not flowering trees, but they do grow all of these new shoots and um, beautiful little soft needles, which I think are pretty cool. Um, Ken, do you have anything cool to tell us about metasequoia that you know? No, other than uh, often find their fossils on doing uh, field work in the Alpine. Yeah. So um, yeah, anyone who's traipsing around BC and in uh, areas with sedimentary rocks may, may find these fossils. Yeah, and actually, if we can focus uh, over on me again for a moment, I can show a couple of fossil examples of metasequoia that we have in our collection. And that'll give you an idea of just how similar they look to those needles today. All right, so there's me. So you guys got a good look at the metasequoia leaves. And this is a 53 million year old metasequoia um, from the Maccabee fossil beds. Looks pretty similar to what we saw in the park there today. And I have also found a few up in Northern BC. We'll see if this, this is a little harder to see. Let's see, oh, there it is. It's a little shiny one. And uh, this one's about 67 million years old. It's that little shiny smear, um, preserved very differently because it's from a different rock formation. Um, but yeah, metasequoia is just a really cool tree. It makes these beautiful, beautiful leaves. Um, and one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is nowadays we would probably consider metasequoia to be um, non-native to British Columbia because it was found, the, the modern examples all come from China from like the 1940s and then they've been planted all over. But really we've had metasequoia in British Columbia for like, like at least 67 million years. So have we really introduced it? <laughs> or are we just sort of putting it back where it's really invasive or cultivated if it used to be here for lots of millions of years. So those are some of the things that I've got to show off. I love taking a walk around uh, this chunk of Beacon Hill Park. Um, I don't know, is now might be a good time for people to ask us questions. Uh, Can you hear me? It's not, a, it's not a question, just a comment um, from Norma on Facebook, who writes, it's awesome to have the opportunity to see the fossils 
listen to the paleontologists, that's you, Victoria, <laughs> and take uh, the tour all at the same time. Thank you for making this possible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I have learned so much. This has been so fun. <laughs> and thanks, Ken, for being the uh, botany knowledge. Uh, I'm a dinosaur person kind of playing at being a paleobotanist here today, but plants are super interesting, and I know, like, dinosaurs get a lot of attention, but... Um, plants are really interesting just in their own right, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we get to sort of talk about them today. Absolutely, and I'm going to um, flip the camera around so we can say so long, unless there's any other question in there. Wait, I'm trying to get Ken in the picture. There he is, way off in the shade. Sorry, the lighting's not good. Any last <laughs> questions, Chris? Um, no, not on, not on Zoom, or I don't see on Facebook. Live, okay, that's that's fine because we're right on time to finish off. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Ken and Victoria. That was really fun, and I learned so much. And the technology, for the most part, works. So yay! Yay! Um, <laughs> yay! And um, I hope to see you all uh, back with us on August nineteenth when we talk about orcas from Saturna Island. So thank you very much, everybody. Ken, you can wave. I'll get you on camera. Oh, my gosh. There we go. <laughs> There's Ken. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Chris. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.